Introduction This book presents the life and the practice of a woman who reached the pinnacle of Buddhist practice in her lifetime. She was known as Meiji Gao. Meiji Gao felt the calling to a spiritual life at an early age. Blessed as a girl with the good fortune to meet some of the most renowned meditation masters of her era, she took their teachings on meditation to heart and, with youthful enthusiasm, earnestly put them into practice. Due to a favorable disposition, she soon developed into a child prodigy, skilled in the art of samadhi meditation. Her mind easily became absorbed in deep concentration for many hours and was witness to many strange and wonderful occurrences. When familial circumstances intervened to prevent her from undertaking a religious vocation, she bided her time patiently, waiting to take advantage of the earliest opportunity. After twenty years of unsatisfactory marriage, a door finally opened for Meiji Gao and she stepped through, entering a life of renunciation. As a nun, she spent many years living and practicing with teachers of great renown. They often praised her for her extraordinary skills in meditation, especially her adeptness with psychic phenomena. Very few of them could equal her prowess in that field of perception. More significantly, however, she succeeded in overcoming her attachment to the conventional world with its ever-changing conditions, and thus attained the unconditioned state of total freedom. Being one of the few known female arahants of the modern era, she became living testimony that the Buddha's goal of supreme enlightenment is possible for everyone, regardless of gender, race, or class. Countless female practitioners lived during the time of the Buddha. Most attained the fruits of the Noble Path, and many were praised by the Buddha. Over and over again in the Buddha's early discourses, his female disciples were commended. They were lauded for their diligence, their wisdom, and their teaching skills. There is no doubt that many women of that time left their families behind and devoted themselves to living the homeless life of a renunciant. In fact, when the Buddha started an order of nuns, many women rushed to join it. Due to the social constraints those women faced, that was an extraordinary achievement. A man's willingness to turn his back on parents, spouse, and children was viewed as evidence of his determination to seek the truth. It was considered virtuous for men to leave home and family behind for the sake of a spiritual vocation. Women, however, tread an altogether more difficult path to a life of renunciation. Enjoying far less freedom than men, they could not leave their families without first begging permission from reluctant spouses, and they were often constrained by duty to aging parents or young children. By starting an order of nuns, the Buddha was opening to women a unique opportunity to lead the homeless life in a way that transcended customary social and cultural constraints. He was also acknowledging that women are as capable of understanding the Tamma as men, which was quite a radical notion at the time. The Bhikkhuni Sangha was a community of nuns founded by the Buddha. It remained a thriving monastic order for over a millennium, but eventually the Bhikkhuni lineage died out due to war and famine. Because no mechanism for its revival was provided by the Buddha, the only ordination opportunity left open to women in Theravadan countries today is ordination as a nun, observing either eight or ten precepts. In Thailand, eight precept nuns are the norm. They are known as mechis. Like the monk, a mechi shaves her head and undertakes training rules not generally observed by Buddhist laypeople. Wearing distinctive white robes that reflect the strict division between the lifestyle of an ordained person and that of a layperson, a mechi observes a standard code of discipline governing suitable attire, conduct, and livelihood. She is not allowed to hire herself out, accept payment for jobs, or engage in the buying and selling of goods and services. She is instructed to keep in mind that a dignified appearance and exemplary behavior can encourage in others a genuine interest in the virtues of Buddhist practice. Most Mechis reside in monasteries administered by monks. Smaller numbers live in their own nunneries, which are often associated with a local monastery. The practice-oriented monasteries, especially those in the Thai forest tradition, give women the free time and the basic requisites they need to pursue a lifestyle of renunciation and meditation. For this reason, many women prefer the opportunities for practice offered in the Mechi communities affiliated with such monasteries. One perceived drawback to that arrangement is that the nuns are relegated to a status clearly secondary to that of the monks. This limitation is alleviated to some extent by the Buddhist understanding that authority and rank in a community are essentially social conventions needed to keep the community functioning smoothly. 
a woman's position in the hierarchy does not in any way reflect her essential worth as a person. The separation of men and women has become so deeply ingrained in most cultures that it is quite natural to experience it in a religious context. But gender is transient. It comes and goes, conditioned by past karma it is a kind of destiny. The essence of one's being is without name and without form, and thus without characteristics of male or female. This is a fundamental tenet of Buddhism, that the attributes of self-identity are devoid of intrinsic essence. Everything that makes a person unique changes continually and eventually disintegrates. Each personality is constantly ceasing to be what it was and becoming something new. Those factors one tends to conceive of as self are impermanent and fleeting. Everything about bodily form and the mind's thoughts and feelings is without intrinsic worth and bound to dissolve. For that reason, clinging to body and mind is a major source of pain and suffering. Realization that the essence of mind, stripped of all external characteristics, has no inherent gender, rank, or status, liberates us from the concepts of separate or common identities that hinder our progress and limit our freedom. All such conventional distinctions must be transcended if we are to sever the bonds that bind us so tightly to the cycle of birth and death. In this respect, all human beings stand on an equal footing, because the fundamental delusions of mind that must be overcome are essentially the same for everyone. Nothing is more amazing than the mind. It is extraordinary what a well-trained mind can do. By nature, Meiji Gao's mind tended to be bold and dynamic. Prophetic dreams and psychic visions occurred effortlessly in her meditation. Her psychic tendencies were both a liability and a source of strength. For years, their attraction blinded her to the need for self-restraint. Later, when she learned how to discipline her mind, she was able to use her unusual abilities in profound and wondrous ways. But inherent tendencies of mind vary significantly from one person to another. Some, like Meiji Gao, are quite active and venturesome. Others are more reserved and cautious. Each has its advantages in meditation. Mechi Gao's dynamic mind allowed her to progress quickly along a path of practice that most people find to be slow and difficult. But it is rare to find someone whose mind combines the degrees of skill and power that Meiji Gao's did. Because of that, it would be nearly impossible for the average person to match her extraordinary range of psychic perception. Those aspects of her practice will not serve as a suitable meditation guide for most practitioners. On a more profound level, however, Meiji Gao's practice points the way beyond the changing conditions of birth and death to the essence of true freedom. At the heart of that realization lies a fundamental distinction between two very different aspects of the mind, the mind's knowing essence and the transient states of mind that arise and cease within it. By not understanding that distinction, we take those transient states to be real, to be the mind itself. In fact, they are all just changing conditions that never remain stable from one moment to the next. The knowing essence of mind is the only real constant. Mostly we lump everything together and call it mind, but actually states of mind exist in conjunction with the knowing of them. With that insight comes the realization that happiness and suffering are realities separate from the mind that knows them. The true essence of mind knows all states and all conditions but attaches to none. Because of that, it lies beyond the shifting states of happiness and suffering. If we can see this, we can put down those conventional realities and let them go. With that understanding, liberating detachment occurs of its own accord. Meiji Gao was a countrywoman who lived a simple village life in the northeastern region of Thailand and overcame enormous difficulties in her attempt to leave home and follow the Buddha's noble path to freedom from suffering. Her persistence, her courage, and her intuitive wisdom enabled her to transcend all conventional boundaries, both those imposed upon her by the world she lived in and those limiting her mind from within, and thereby find release from the bondage of birth and death. Although she lived and practiced under the same constraints that most women practitioners have had to endure, she embraced that challenge, skillfully harmonizing her practice to fit smoothly within the conventional monastic framework. By surrendering wholeheartedly to that time-honored system, she succeeded in turning its apparent drawbacks to her advantage. Instead of complaining of unequal status, Meiji Gao diligently cultivated a mind of clear and spontaneous awareness and thereby succeeded in cutting through her deeply rooted delusion of personal and cultural identity. Viewed in the light of transcendent insight, the solid world of class and difference in which she had spent her entire life evaporated and disappeared. 
Monks who are skilled in meditation are not biased by cultural conditioning. They have no doubt that women who observe the eight precepts and practice seriously can attain exceptionally high levels of meditation. In truth, women have a remarkable capacity for understanding tamma and can achieve deep levels of samadhi and develop extraordinary knowledge and wisdom. Many nuns and laywomen in Thailand surpass the monks in their accomplishments. For this reason, meditation masters generally hold female practitioners in high esteem, considering them equal to men in their spiritual potential. In the Thai forest tradition today, many revered teachers believe that women are capable of the highest spiritual attainment. They often recommend female monastics as exemplary teachers. Many forest meditation masters have women students, both nuns and laywomen, who are recognized as teachers in their own right. These women actively participate in their religious communities as skilled meditators, healers, or mentors, and are revered by local people. Meiji Gao was just such a woman. Practicing nuns like her have left a legacy to inspire future generations and to show how the Buddhist path of practice may be reopened by anyone, male or female. This account of Meiji Gao's life is presented in the form of a narrative biography, using the available facts placed in a historical context to tell the story of her life. I have included what information I could find to place her life in a proper setting of time and culture, citing her own words and her contemporaries' words and the known events of their time. The story I tell was compiled from various Thai language sources. I am deeply indebted to Ajahn Mahabua who, through his spoken and written teachings, related many key stories about her meditation practice. I have used his lucid descriptions of the transcendent levels of insight and wisdom to work out the details of Meiji Gao's step-by-step -step progression to enlightenment. She was one of Ajahn Mahabua's most gifted disciples, and he has left no doubt about her spiritual attainments. Ajahn Inthawai was an important inspiration for writing this book. Having enjoyed a close relationship with Meiji Gao since childhood, he proved to be a valuable source of cultural background and historical detail. Meiji Gao's surviving relatives provided intimate accounts of her family life, as well as the early years of her renunciation of worldly affairs. Dr. Pensri Makaranon, who nursed her tirelessly in old age, has shared a vivid recollection of Meiji Gao's final years, including many of the fascinating stories Meiji Gao herself related to her medical attendants. All of this material I have stitched together to weave the fabric of her life. However, many irreconcilable gaps and inconsistencies appeared in the different written and verbal accounts. I found multiple versions of the same story, and in some instances, crucial details are missing. So I have also resorted to my imagination to fill out the picture of her life and her practice, adding graphic details to fashion a vibrant and clear mental image of the woman and her extraordinary achievements. This is not a work of scholarship so much as a narrative biography that is intended to provide a source of inspiration to those who are devoted to Buddhist practice. With that purpose in mind, it is hoped that this book will be viewed mainly as an invitation to contemplate the depths and subtleties of mind that are experienced on the Buddha's path to total liberation.